Okay, uh, good afternoon folks and welcome to the second um, podcast cast of myself, Alfie Pritchard and Alan English. Hello there. That was Alan. Um, anyway, this afternoon, um, it, it's going to be quite interesting. I was going to do an introduction on the difference between bipolar and manic depression because there is a big difference but what I'm going to do is just introduce it so next week or the week after we can go into in much depth because it, it, it's a very important distinction um, so basically bipolar um, is an invention which is driven by the pharmaceutical industries um, and there's a, a massive amount of evidence to prove this. Now, I suffer from um, manic depression and occasional anxiety. And, th you know, there was no need to diagnose it once, you know, once I found out about it. Now, if in the... If this happened to me now, there will be about five or six different categories of manic depression or as the pharmaceutical industry likes to call it bipolar and there would have been um, a whole series of different medications that would have been given to me if those medications did not work it wasn't because it was a bad diagnosis basically the diagnosis would have been okay but it was because i was given the wrong drugs um so as i say this is just a little teaser so i must admit it's something very close to me i take one tablet um a day but under this new regime of bipolar i could be taking five or six different tablets a day um, because the pharmaceutical industry is always searching for a new disorder called bipolar. And I think this is one reason why me and Alan prefer, if you don't mind me saying this, Alan, to keep it to manic depression. That's exactly what it is. I yeah. mean, uh, bipolar, I mean, it's, uh, I think it, you know, the, the very word kind of evokes almost a temperature in a way. When I think of bipolar, for some reason I think of the colours blue and white, whereas uh, with my depression, you know, I think of uh, pink, red and white and just generally rage, because that's exactly what it is. It's a mm. very raging thing, I know, because it, it blows around you, you know, it possesses you in uh, a way that's, you know, it's sometimes very high, hard to articulate, but you know, a lot of people have in uh, well, you know what a lot of people have in uh, you know very recently kind of you know come out with you know what they're saying. I'm reading the right now I'm reading An Unquiet Mind by K. Redfield Jameson who also wrote uh, Cuts by Fire which we quoted quite liberally from last week and you know mental health is uh, it's you know it matters it's you know it's emotionally a very very huge thing and it matters especially right now with our persistent, uncertain situations, no one knows quite surely uh, where they are going to be financially, you know, socially, you know, and, and so forth. And it's really, really, di really, really difficult for a lot of people to just kind of stay level with it. And you know, it's and you know, definitely my depression, you know, kind of you know, as a condition of both the mind. I think also as a condition of uh, you know, society is. You know, we, we are kind of very like a my depressed you know, kind of society mm. or, and yeah, it's 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 very very it's it's a very much you know hidden deep within us. It's an ongoing thing. And it's still, no matter what the media likes to pretend, it's still a very silent, deadly illness. Um and we we are still not well the professionals are still not sure what brings it on 
well, it, 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 nothing brings it on, basically. There's no exact trigger. I've had my depression since I was a kid, but I, I discovered that much later in life. Um, but as I say, this is going to be a sort of a continuous exploration of um, how we're going to try to organise ourselves around what this is all about anyway, which is creativity and madness. Um, so can I lead with Grimaldi yeah, the, the clown? Yeah, go ahead. Now, um, th this is a very old story. I was born not far from the grave of Grimaldi the Clown. Now Grimaldi the Clown um, was the drink, the celebrity, he, he was a celebrity of Regency London and outside London. He was an actor, he was a clown and he was an acrobat um, and he was performing every single day and he was a a person that high society adored he, because he was funny, he was fast, he was quick, he, he could perform continuously. But he suffered crippling manic depression, that we would call it now. Absolutely awful. Now, he, he went to see a doctor. Remember, this is Regency, England, so there wasn't no NHS, you, you paid to go and see a quack. And Grimaldi explained what his symptoms were, tiredness, frustration, anger, raw anger, didn't know what was going on, fear, terror, you name it, it's got it. Um, suicidal thoughts. And the doctor recommended a cure. He recommended the exact cure that Grimaldi the Clown, and the doctor didn't know he was talking to Grimaldi the Clown. The doctor said there was only one thing I could help you with, or I could advise you. If I was you, I would get a ticket to Sadler's Wells Theatre, where the great Grimaldi the Clown is performing. You'll go there and you will feel so much happier. And Grimaldi the Clown said, that is the problem. I am a Grimaldi the Clown. Bang. <laughs> Need we say anything else? Um, I don't think so. Anyway, <laughs> um, that's just one story. One of a few stories that we're going to talk about this week, because we were going to talk, and we still were, are going to talk about um, humour and creativity and manic depression. And I think, Alan, are you going to start this one? Or? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just carrying on with it. I mean, I think, you know, there is a, I think often the best humour is kind of born of melancholy. You know, people who kind of derive the mm. most honest, most humorous insights are themselves completely blown and miserable. I think it's because if you have a certain temperament and you're able to see yourself and the world as it is, unfettered with the illusions that I suppose we all need on some, on some level to survive. You know, but if you see the world as it is without, you know, kind of comforting delusions, you are going to be very miserable, but on the other kind of flip side of that is you're also going to be very honest. And it's out of this kind of honesty that you get humour. And Can I just interrupt for one second? Go for it. I found a quote earlier on um, in, in one of the many books that we've got. Um, I think we should actually put up a reading this soon. Anyway, um, it's an interesting quote back in what Alan's saying. For some people, the world is already too much. They, you know, they sense the world is just too much. It's far too much. Everything about it is too much. But as I say, we'll explore this either soon or at a later date. I interrupted Alan. Sorry, I'll no, chat. I, 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 can't, I can't get that, you know, it's, I think it's a difficult thing in this kind of, in our kind of ultra-competitive Western society for a lot of people to accept, because if you grow up and say to see an average city worker or someone here, oh, the world is too much, I mean, you're not going to get an awful lot of underst understanding or even sympathy, no. because this is the way our kind of world works now, and yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the world is too much, we kind of, you know, the old kind of English thing, you 
stiff off a lip, you know, kind of man up and get on with it, okay. You, you, you know, and any kind of display of weakness is, is frowned upon. And it's just automatic. It's just smooth. You know what I mean? It's Even though the media and aspects of the cultural industries refuse to accept that, they, they think about it's okay being a celebrity and talking about your depression and what have you. But it's not okay if you're an unemployed, either a single mum or a single father, in a tower block, and you just want to jump off out the window, and you want to kill yourself. There's a big difference. I, I think there's a big class and social difference around how yeah. we treat. Yeah, you know, I think it's because when uh, celebrities discuss their uh, depressive symptoms, I mean, I suppose. Celebrities are first and foremost entertainers. They provide us with escapism. <laughs> yeah. And in a funny, you know, really kind of sad way, they're talking about the depression is just another form of escapism. Whereas, you know, the kind of the ordinary situation they, they describe, you've just described there, with the kind of the lady living in a tower block wanting to throw herself off. I mean, that, that is too banal, too close to home for a lot of people to even contemplate. Mm. You know, because it's the because the very thing that you know, and trying to live life in a kind of a society like um, that you're constantly trying to shut out. And it's okay. I mean, it's okay to kind of uh, luxuriate in a kind of a glamorized celebrity depression, but it's like in a funny way. Also, you know, the kind of celebrity also, you know, I, actual actually trivializes depression because although this, you know, because you know. The kind of the fact of their the fact of a, you know, a celebrity being a celebrity actually trivializes, in a sense, their depression and their and and it kind of takes away from that kind of connection which is so essential between the artist and their audience. The fact of their celebrity diminishes that connection. And so when a, a celebrity or a famous artist talks about their you know their depression, the fact of their being a celebrity diminishes the connection that they hope to make by that admission and, it's, and it can, can, can trivialise very real struggles behind a very kind of glamorous sheen that it's a kind of people uh, you know, luxuriating whilst kind of blocking out the banality and the reality of living with depression and living with kind of manic depression because a lot and you know this is what you know, when you're a lot of artists speak when they experience some of the artists that we're going to talk about here. They'll look at F. F. Scott's Fitzgerald. They'll look a little bit at uh, kind of you know, um, you know, Oliver Reed and Keith Moon here. I mean, you know, a lot of their insights they have and you know, people like Peter Sellers, eh? Peter Sellers, Robin Williams. Oh yes, Peter Peter Sellers, Robin Williams. Mm. I mean, Could we know, jump into? Sorry to interrupt. Go for it. Could we jump into Scott Fitzgerald? Go for it. Yeah, the okay. great um, yeah, writer of the American Dream in the okay, 1920s, in, in the Roaring Twenties. This was a man who had it, had it all. Literally, he had it all. No, it's, okay, well, okay, this is, this is fascinating. And this, this is, is from a go. small essay that he wrote called Crack yeah, Up. Yeah, okay, I'm going to read a, a part of it. I'm going to go from page 55 to 62, so seven pages but listen in guys i mean this stuff is well i mean you know, it's it's insightful so this is a you know it's uh, and it's brilliant and it's funny and it's so so real so so real so real and, and real at the same time okay this is the cr the crack up written by f scott fitzgerald february 1936. of course all life is a process of breaking down but the blows that do the dramatic side of the work, the big sudden blows that come or seem to come from outside, the ones you remember and blame things on, and in moments of weakness tell your friends about, don't show their effect all at once. There is another sort of blow that comes from within, that you don't feel until it's too late to do anything about it, until you realise with finality that in some regard you will never be as good a man again. The first sort of breakage seems to happen quick. The second kind happens almost without your knowing it, but is realised suddenly indeed. Before I go on with this short history, let me make a general observation. 
The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. One should, for example, be able to see that things are hopeless and yet be determined to make them otherwise. This philosophy fitted on to my early adult life when I saw the improbable, the implausible, and often the impossible come true. Life was something you dominated if you were any good. Life yielded easily to intelligence and effort, or to what proportion could be mustered of both. It seemed a romantic business to be a successful literary man. You were not ever going to be as famous a movie star, but what note you had was probably longer lived. You were never going to have the power of a man of strong political or religious convictions, but you were certainly more independent. Of course, within the practice of your trade, you, you were forever unsatisfied. But I, for one, would not have chosen any other. As the twenties passed, with my own twenties marching, marching a little ahead of them, my two juvenile regrets at not being big enough or good enough to play football in college, and at not getting overseas during the war, resolved themselves into childish waking dreams of imaginary heroism that were good enough to go to, sleepless, to sleep on in restless nights. The big problems of life seemed to solve themselves, and if the business of fixing them was difficult, it made one too tired to think of more general problems. Life, ten years ago, was a largely a personal matter. I must hold in balance the sense of futility of effort and the sense of the necessity to struggle, the conviction of the inevitability of failure and still the determination to succeed, and more than these, the contradiction between the dead hand of the past and the high intentions of the future. If I could do this through the common ills, domestic, professional and personal, then the ego would continue as an arrow shot from nothingness to nothingness with such force that only gravity would bring it to earth at last. For seventeen years, with a year of deliberate loafing and resting out in the centre, things went on like that, with a new chore only a nice prospect for the next day. I was living hard, too, but up to forty-nine it'll be all right, I said. I can count on that. For a man who's lived as I have, that's all you could ask. And then, ten years this side of forty-nine, I suddenly realised that I had prematurely cracked. Now a man can crack in many ways, can crack in the head, in which case the power of decision is taken from you by others, or in the body, when one can but submit to the white hospital world, or in the nerves. William Seabrook, in an unsympathetic book, tells with some pride and a movie ending of how he became a public charge. What led to his alcoholism, or was bound up with it, was a collapse of his nervous system. Though the present writer was not so entangled, having been at the time not tasted so much as a glass of beer for six months, it was his nervous reflexes that were giving way. Too much anger and too many tears. Moreover, to go back to my thesis that life has a varying offensive, the realisation of having cracked was not simultaneous with a blow, but with a reprieve. Not long before, I had sat in the office of a great doctor and listened to a grave sentence. With what, in retrospect, seems some equanimity, I had gone on about my affairs in the city where I was then living, not caring much, not thinking how much I had been left undone, or what could become of this and that responsibility, like people do in books. I was well insured, and anyhow, I had been only a mediocre caretaker of the things left in my hands, even of my talent. But I had a strong, sudden instinct that I must be alone. I didn't want to see any people at all. I had seen so many people all my life. I was an average mixer, but more than average in a tendency to identify with myself, my ideas, my destiny, with those of all classes that I came in contact with. I was always saving or being saved. In a single morning I would go through the emotions ascribable to Wellington at Waterloo. I lived in a world of inscrutable hostiles and inalienable friends and supporters. But now I wanted to be absolutely alone, and so arranged a certain insulation from ordinary cares. It was not an unhappy time. I went away, and there were fewer people. I found I was good and tired. I could lie around and was glad to. 
sleeping or dozing sometimes 20 hours a day and in the intervals trying resolutely not to think. Instead I made lists, made lists and tore them up, hundreds of lists of cavalry leaders and football players and cities and popular tunes and pictures and happy times and hobbies and houses lived in and how many suits since I left the army and how many pairs of shoes I didn't count the suit I bought in Sorrento that shrunk nor the pumps and dress shirt and collar that I carried around for years and never wore because the pumps got damp and grainy and the shirt and collar got yellow and starch rotted and lists of women I'd liked and of the times I had let myself be snubbed by people who had not been my betters in character or ability. And then, surprisingly, surprisingly, I got better and cracked like an old plate as soon as I heard the news. That is the real end of this story. What was to be done about it will have to rest in what used to be called the womb of time. Suffice it to say that after about an hour of solitary pillow hugging, I began to realise that for two years my life had been a drawing on resources that I did not possess, that I had been mortgaging myself physically and spiritually up to the hilt. What was the small gift of life given back in comparison to that, when there had been once a pride of direction and a confidence and enduring independence? I realised that in those two years, in order to preserve something, and in a hush, maybe, maybe not, I had weaned myself from all the things I used to love, that every act of life from the morning toothbrush to the friend at dinner had become an effort. I saw that for a long time I had not liked people and things, but had only followed the rickety old pretense of liking. I saw that even my love for those closest to me was becoming only an attempt to love, that my casual relations with an editor, a tobacco seller, the child of a friend, were only what I remembered I should do from other days. All in the same month I became bitter about such things as the sound of the radio, the advertisements in the magazines, the screech of tracks, the dead silence of the country, contemptuous at human softness, immediately if secretively quarrelsome towards hardness, hating the night when I couldn't sleep and hating the day because it went toward night. I slept on the heart side now because I knew that the sooner I could tire that out, even a little, the sooner would I co come that blessed hour of a nightmare, which like a catharsis would enable me to meet the new day. There were certain spots, certain faces I could look at. Like most Middle Westerners, I have never had any but the vaguest race, race prejudices. I always had a secret yen for the lovely Scandinavian blondes who sat on porches in St. Paul but hadn't emerged enough economically to be part of what was then society. They were too nice to be chickens and too quickly off the farmlands to seize a place in the sun, but I remember going round blocks to catch a single glimpse of shining hair, the bright shock of a girl I'd never know. This is urban, unpopular talk. It strays afield from the fact that in the latter days I couldn't stand the sight of Celts English, politicians, strangers, Virginians, Negroes, light or dark, hunting people or retail clerks, and middlemen in general, all writers, I avoided writers very carefully because they can perpetuate trouble as no one else can, and all the classes as classes, and most of them as members of their class. Trying to cling to something, I liked doctors and girl children up to the age of about 13, and well brought up boy children from about 8 years old on. I could have peace and happiness with these few categories of people. I forgot to add that I liked old men, men over 70, sometimes over 60 if their faces looked seasoned. I liked Catherine Hepburn's face on the screen no matter what was said about her pretentiousness, and Miriam Hopkins' face, and old friends if I only saw them once a year and could remember their ghosts. All rather inhuman and undernourished, isn't it? Well, that, children, is the true sign of cracking up. It is not a pretty picture. Inevitably, it was carted here and there within its frame and exposed to various critics. One of them can only be described as a person whose life makes other people's lives seem like death. Even this time when she was cast in the usually unappealing role of Job's comforter. In spite of the fact that this story is over, let me append our conversation as a sort of postscript. Instead of being so sorry for yourself, listen, she said. She always says, listen, because she thinks while she talks, really thinks. So she said, listen, suppose this wasn't a crack in you. Suppose it was a crack in the Grand Canyon. The crack's in me, I said heroically. Listen, the world only exists in your eyes, your conception of it. 
you can make it as big or as small as you want to. And you're trying to be a little puny individual. By God, if I ever cracked, I'd try to make the world crack with me. Listen, the world only exists through your apprehension of it. And so it's much better to say that it's not you that's cracked, it's the Grand Canyon. Baby ate up all her Spinoza. I don't know anything about Spinoza. I know, she spoke then, of old woes of her own, that seemed in the telling to have been more dolorous than mine, and how she had met them, overridden them, beaten them. I felt a certain reaction to what she had said, but I am a slow-thinking man, and it occurred to me simultaneously that of all natural forces, vitality is the incommunicable one. In days when juice came into one as an article without duty, one tried to distribute it, but always without success. To further mix metaphors, vitality never takes. You have it, or you haven't it, like health or brown eyes or honour or a baritone voice. I might have asked some of it from her, neatly wrapped and ready for home cooking and digestion, but I could never have got it. Not if I'd waited around for a thousand hours with a tin cup of self-pity. I could walk from her door, holding myself very carefully, like cracked crockery, and go home or go away into the world of bitterness, where I was making a home with such materials as are found there, and quote to myself after I left her door, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? Well, thank you, Alan. Um, could I just add a couple of little bits to that? Um, sure. I, I mean, Scott Fitzgerald was, in the 20s, his three big novels, um, This Side of Paradise, Great Gatsby, and oh my God, and I forgot the the third one um, it'll come to me in a moment but he was married to Zilda Fitzgerald and Zilda was part of the wild set that Scott Fitzgerald moved in um, and she was diagnosed a schizophrenic again it, it's a, a, a distinction that I don't like using um, but she was hospitalised quite a few times. He looked after her, he paid all her dues. Um, she stayed in um, a very expensive clinic in Switzerland for some time. She was up and down, she would get better, she would come out. She loved dancing. But with all the, the money that both of them had, I mean, she was a very talented artist in her own right. Um, but they were just spending it, spending it, spending it. Even when she was obviously very ill, she was just going into shops and spending money. Um, so she was in and out of institutions. And that must have played on his nerves as well when he realised, and she was realised as well, that the time had moved on. Times have changed. They was part of something that had gone. They was the war, you know, the Roaring Twenties. It had finished, um, and he looked after her, paid for it, and they did have a child, which did not doesn't appear too much in in any of their um, memoirs. Anyway, he died. Um, and she remained in a very expensive um, clinic which unfortunately was burnt down in the 1940s and she was burnt to death. So it's an incredibly tragic life that was led by two of the great Roaring Twenties icons. Um, so you know, you had on the one hand Scott Fitzgerald, who I think may have been depressed anyway before his, his crack up, and you had his wife, who was diagnosed very early as being schizophrenic, and they just ripped through the twenties on a high, the biggest high that probably anybody could have lived with. Um, so on that not very happy note, I think we'll move on. Is that okay with you, Alan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything, anything you want to add to that? Well, yeah, I mean, okay, we've, uh, 
Now, I think I've been also reading through the uh, life of Arthur Reed, Evil sure. Spirits, and you're as a kind of a, it's a different generation to F. Scott Fitzgerald, but there's a there's a kind of a, a, a couple of uh, chapters here that I might want to explore. I mean, I think they're based on. Uh, and, uh, I want to look at uh, page two seven three, where he talks at where uh, Oliver Reed talks you know briefly about. Uh, Okay, it's like you know, uh, painkillers. Okay. Now, Oliver Reed, as uh, kind of a lot of people know, was a notorious drunk and a rabble rouser and you know, a hell raiser and what have you. You know, so, but a lot of that was, uh, you know, much, much of that was you know, kind of a put on, but kind of a lot of it, you know, a kind of an act, but a lot of it, uh, a, lot, a lot of it wasn't. I mean, he did kind of feel a lot of pain and kind of melancholy. I think he was he was terrified of death and he, you know, he was kind of you know, in fact, you know, a man who was you know, totally for living life to the full and you know, he frequently you, he frequently self-medicated with uh, with alcohol to, you know, to ensure his sleeping but in this here page 273 painkillers had long since replaced alcohol to ensure Oliver had a comfortable night Sleep was something he could dip in and out of, catching the early repeats of the world, ser world service news or snatches of obscure programs. He rarely dreamed. When he did, there were invariably twin nightmares he had suffered, on and off for more than 20 years. Like the psychiatrist studying Oliver's youth, they provided intriguing material. In the first, there was a huge black fly crawling across the ceiling above his head. You would watch it grow, as big as your fist, and then as big as your head, the buzz of its wings getting louder and louder. Suddenly it would drop. Before it reached him, Oliver would be awake. The fly never reaches me, but I know if it ever did, I would die, smothered, dead. When he eventually fell back to sleep, the second nightmare would arrive. He would be studying a laboratory jar. As he got closer, he could see two round objects preserved in liquid. At first he would think they were peeled white onions. In a millisecond would come the realisation that he was inspecting his own testicles. And with that, the gasping shock would wake him. That is the real fight now, admitted Oliver. That one puts the fear of God in me. Yeah, I, uh, Oliver Reed. Um... There's one more thing I'd like to kind of uh, trick him before. I mean, he was quite very good friends with the, uh, the Who drummer, uh, Keith, Keith Moon. Moon. I want you, and there's a couple of uh, things I want to you know, just check out on him. You see, he he came to a sad end here. I know. Okay, on the second on second Sunday of July 1974, Keith Moon arrived at Room Hall, which was Oliver's residence, mm. as usual, unannounced but strangely subdued. Never the healthiest looking individual. To Oliver and Jackie, the musician appeared very pale and depressively washed out. Moon's wrist was bandaged and it was obviously causing him considerable pain. He told me he had a fight in a bar and cut his wrist, recalled Oliver. It was a deliberate lie. The previous Monday, and only hours after driving back to London from the actor's home, Moon had attempted to commit suicide by slashing his wrist with a broken bottle. He had refused, he refused to have the wound treated and it slowly turned septic. There were other things Keith Moon did not tell his host. One was that he had found a new girlfriend, a 19-year-old Swedish woman called Annette Walter Lax. Another was his decision, glimpsed through the endless fog of alcohol and drugs, to book himself into a Hampstead rehabilitation clinic. There's a one more thing I want to check out here. On the Thursday of the 8th of September, 1977, Oliver awoke to be confronted by the news he had long known was inevitable. The front page of the Daily Mirror contains just one headline. Drugs, death, drama of pop wild man, Moon. Keith Moon, the man forever responsible for Oliver Reed's sense of the bizarre, was dead. His shadow was always on the sunny side of the street with me because of that path he showed me, Oliver was to say. To Oliver, it was a wasteful, frightening, self-deprecating death, and for the first time, sowed within the actor thoughts of his own mortality. 
I had been beaten before, I had been shot at, I had nearly died before, but that morning I wondered what it would be like to know you were going to die. That whatever you did or said or tried to do made no difference. You were just too far gone. Yeah, that's a beautiful story actually. Um, and Keith Moon, as, as people know, um, The Who was one of my um, favourite groups. Um, and they attempted to support Keith Moon through everything. They knew that it was possibly impossible to cure whatever was going on. He was on everything. Um, so there was a sense of... Um, he, he was doomed, basically. He, he was probably one of the best drummers. Um, he, he, he's never been actually given that credit. He was a remarkable drummer. He was incredibly disciplined. When he, when he sat behind the drum, he was disciplined. He, he knew what he was up to. Um, and Pete Townsend, the, the who leader, songwriter, invented all the madness and everything. He himself suffered from massive depression and addictions. But they, the Who, as a band, tried to protect Keith Moon. And I'm going to do a downer here on a, another group called the Rolling Stones, which everybody adores. Um, and a young man who made the Rolling Stones, who invented the Rolling Stones, was Brian Jones. Brian Jones could not hold it together. The fame, the girls, the, you know, and, and, and you know, I mentioned that, the sex and the drugs were just too much. So, the, in, the person who inspired the Rolling Stones was kicked out by Mick Jagger. I didn't support him. So he died incredibly lonely. Um, and there's this whole thing about that world of fame, madness, self-destruction. I, I think one, once a person hits a particular point um, in their downward path, they can never get to that crossroads of I'll go that way or that way. They always go one way. They go a bit further. They go a bit further and they can never come back. Um, I'm not aiming for a conclusion here, but um, it just, it, it's that again, you know, what we see of Keith Moon is a clown when we watch him. But my God, he was an artist. And when you listen to the Who's best tracks, you can hear that drumming and it is incredible. Um, and I think that's gonna lead me on, if you don't mind to somebody else, Peter Sellers. Now we all know Peter Sellers, mostly through the Pink Panther films, which are not very good actually. I mean there's some other good scenes in it, but as, as films they were, you know, they made money. Now Peter Sellers um, never knew himself. He actually, people who worked with Peter Sellers didn't like him. I didn't trust him. And one of the reasons was because he didn't know himself. He could never talk about himself. He would talk about voices that he made up. And he made quite a few films where he played a double or he played three people. Um, and of course the classic is Dr. Strangelove where he plays the President of the United States of America, um, an English Lieutenant, and a and, and Dr. Strangelove, a mad Nazi, who's invented the death machine. Now, they're very funny characterizations, but to me, what holds that film together is not Peter Sellers, it's George C. Scott, a brilliant actor, a fantastic actor, um, much more of a, of a mad genius in Dr. Strangelove. And I think that held Peter Sellers together. He was up against somebody great, so he, he could contain himself. 
So let's make another film, The Mouse That Roared, where, he, again, he plays three different characters. And I watched it the other day, and I, I didn't know what I was watching. Not in terms of the film, but in terms of the characters that he was trying to portray. But he's still very funny. He had this ability to be a bit funny with them. The one film to me where he stands out is The Lady Killers, where he plays, um, well, it, it, a spiv, he's, he's a gangster. And he is funny in that, mostly because he's got other good performers around him, in particular Alec Guinness. So he, he was contained, he, he didn't go all over the place. Um, also, he was incredibly um, panicky, inferior, he had a massive inferiority complex. And that came to the front when he made this dreadful film, um, Casino Royale, it was meant to be um, a send-up of James Bond. Orson Welles made an appearance in that film. And Sellers went into a, a, a breakdown. He was terrified of performing, of, of even being near Orson Welles. And there's a, a scene where he, he was meant to be opposite Orson Welles, but he, he couldn't do it, so it, it was split. Orson Welles was playing to an empty chair, and likewise Peter Sellers. But it came about that he himself suffered incredible depression, but he would never talk about it. Even though other people could see it, even though his best friend, if he, if he had a best friend, um, Spike Milligan, who talked openly about his psychosis, his hallucinations, but he's very funny still. Even now, he's, he's incredibly funny. So what I'm saying is that even some of the best comedians, maybe, not all of them, some of them don't know themselves. They hide behind the characters that, is in, that they've invented. But that doesn't apply to every one of them. As, as you know, you know far more than I do about um, Robin Williams. Now that was a bit of a rambling thing around Peter Sellers because he's still considered to be one of the great um, comedians uh, on the cinema. I personally find him quite distant, quite cold, but there are one or two f films that I like that, he, that, you know, that he, he's appeared in. But um, that's just one aspect of you know, being a comedian, being incredibly successful. Maybe the only thing he cared about, I don't know, I'm being cruel here, is money. He was making a fortune out of all these films. A lot of them, you know, quite bad. But um, in terms of friendships, he could not hold a friendship down. He could not hold a relationship down with, with women at all. Although he purported to adore women. Um, so that's a sort of pretty sad ending. He, he actually died of a heart attack, quite young. Um, there's other comedians who are far more, you know, pain, but far more human. And um, I'm, I'm thinking of Robin Williams. So that was a bit of a pre that was a bit of a round the bush. But I just wanted to get that in um, about this whole thing about humour and depression and sometimes secrecy. Right, Adam, sorry about that. No, 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 no problem, no problem, no. I mean, you were just talking about uh, talking about Robin Williams. I mean, uh, you know, when he was passed away, he uh, he was afflicted not only with depression but with a suffered of uh, financial problems. He had to take uh, roles he didn't really want in order to pay off his bills, and he had also uh, contracted a degenerative disease to the point where he was filming a movie and he was uh, selling his co-stars. I don't even know how to be funny anymore. And when it's this kind of gift, when it's that essential to your personality and you find yourself losing it, your very reason for being suddenly goes along with it. It's kind of tragic what happened to him. And I'd definitely you know, find out you know, a little bit more about it, but he was, you know, 
it was kind of a shock when he, he kind of left us, you know, left left this planet. And you know, I think he, he is sadly missed by many people. Today. Yeah, and there was a, an incredibly warm personality there. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, somebody you could well like, somebody you know, maybe even trust a lot. That brings me to another comedian, one of the um, all-time sort of greats on TV and on radio, which is Tony Hancock. Um, now I do think that Hancock was a genius. He could take a script um, and he, he could keep... Just so you'll be established, uh, when we may see Hancock, we're talking about the comedian, not the health minister. Yeah, not, no, not, the, not the madman. <laughs> Not the one who, who, who's, um, how could you say, we'd leave him alone. <laughs> He's a clown that's killing people. No, yeah, yeah Tony Hancock, absolutely everything about his, his comedy. He had good script writers, but that doesn't matter. It's how you deliver the script. And Hancock could. I mean, you know, to listen to him now, to watch some of his, you know, his, Hancock, Hancock's half hour on BBC in the was it 60s or 70s. I mean, they are hilarious. Not just because of the script, because of the timing, the professionalism. That he did, and and you you kind of love the character, but at the same time you you feel sorry for the character. You oh, I don't, no no don't don't go there no please you know. And he had this sort of. It was all based in suburbia, all these, this, this, well they're not adventures, they're just little insights into a particular form of English life. And he captured it. As I say, he had very good script writers, but it was his ability to project this fairly sort of chaotic, um, almost lovable individual. But, as fame and money began to flow in, his insecurities became more and more pronounced. Um, he became very violent to his wife. His sidekick in Hancock's Half Hour was um, one of the Carry On stars, Sid James. Hancock was convinced that James was trying to take over Hancock's half hour. James didn't have anything. He, 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 he knew that he could not match. You know, that was a great thing. But Hancock was getting more and more paranoid um, and more and more almost impossible to work with. But he could still present the image of a brilliant comedian. And it was when he went to Australia. He, he, he committed suicide. I think um, that it, his whole life really did fall apart. He was in a, a strange land that, you know, the o Australians love the humour, but they had, had a different way of um, presenting TV and, and presenting Hancock's humour. He made two films that are interesting, but they don't match Hancock when he was at his peak of, of comedy. Um, and maybe he was at that peak at a time when he was doing the Scots Fitzgerald, when he was entering a crack up, but didn't realise it. Like most people, um, you know, don't realise when the crack up is arriving, except those who have been through it. Um, so that's another sort of aspect of, I, I think, where humour, um, it's a projection of something else of the character that they're, you know, they're projecting. I think, I wouldn't like to be sort of, um, I instinctively feel comfortable with, with that analysis. It's like the song, Let's All Drink to the Death of a Clown. I mean, the image of the clown in, in the circus, you know, there's always a tear behind the, the mask. And so it is, yeah, the more I think about it, it's a very sad um, position to be in, to make people laugh, but not feel anything yourself. Right.
Well, I think I'll end it there on that one. We were going to briefly talk about uh, eugenics, actually, the, uh, uh, and uh, euthanasia. Yeah, that's going to be next week. We get, um, we're already spending a lot of time on this one. This is, um, we're based upon a book, which you've got the notes, haven't you? You've yeah, got the, the introduction. Yes, yeah. the introduction, yeah, yeah. Um, oops, just getting the book. Okay, this is uh, Asperger's Children, uh, the aut uh, origins of autism in Nazi Vienna. And uh, okay, uh, yeah, we've, we've read uh, quite a lot today, uh, and uh, but I just uh, just want to I just uh, I kind of want to get uh, through. Uh, just get through, uh, you know, just a, a little bit of, uh, you know, just a, to kind of briefly mention what we all, what, what it was that this guy was, uh, it's like, I don't know. I mean, I'll just, I'll, okay, I'll just, I'll mention it briefly, okay, cause just, to, just to keep it, it, it It's what you read the other day. Yeah. Okay. Hans Asperger, the pioneer of autism and Asperger's syndrome in Nazi Vienna, has been celebrated for his compassionate defense of children with disabilities. But in this groundbreaking book, you know, prize-winning historian Edith Schiffer exposes that Asperger was not only involved in the racial policies of Hitler's Third Reich, he was complicit in the murder of children. As the Nazi regime slaughtered millions across Europe during World War II, it sorted people according to race, religion, behavior, and physical condition for either treatment or elimination. Nazi psychiatrists targeted children with with different kinds of minds, especially those thought to lack social skills, claiming the Reich had no place for them. Asperger and his colleagues endeavoured to mould certain autistic children into productive citizens while transferring others they deemed untreatable to Spiegel Grant, one of the Reich's deadliest child killing centres. Yeah, there's one bit you, I think we missed out. Can I just borrow the book a moment? Sure, go for it, it. It's right near the start, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. As you probably garret, uh, gathered, um, and it was a much better read. Yeah. Ah, that's the one. Um, sorry, folks. We, we can go really into detail of euthanasia next yeah. week, but this is this introduction one. Okay, you want, okay, really, you, okay yeah. you want me to look at the introduction? I yeah, maybe you read it out. out. It's about the boy and the fly. Yeah. Okay, I was. Uh, no, is that? Yes, okay, yeah. yes, yes, I've got it. So, so what I've just read there was the inside cover. What I'm going to read here is the introduction to the book, and we're going to yeah. explore this more fully. I'm going to read this, and we're going to talk about it more fully because this this matters a lot to me individually because I am autistic, and I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome at age 16. And it's been a lot of well, kind of uh, conversation, shall we say, on the autistic community. You know, in light of what's been revealed in this book, how you know should we keep the term Asperger's syndrome? Should we not? So here we go, the introduction to uh, Asperger's Children by Edith Schaffer. What is the difference between a butterfly and a fly? The butterfly does not grow up in the room as the fly does, said Harrow. This was his intelligence test. Harrow chose to talk about the fly. It is a completely different development. The fly mother lays many, many eggs in a gap in the floorboards and then a few days later the maggots crawl out. I have read this once in a book where the floor talks. I could die laughing when I think of it. What is looking out of this little tub? A giant head with a tiny body and a trunk like an elephant. And then a few days later they cocoon themselves in and then suddenly there are some dear flies crawling out. Harrow and other children were growing up in a room too, cocooned at Hans Asperger's curative education clinic at the University of Vienna Children's Hospital. Like the curiously shaped larvae, they stuck out. Differences such as theirs had become more objectionable in the Third Reich, and the doctors and nurses on the ward were working to develop the children. Asperger held that with proper understanding, love and guidance, they could find their place in the organism of the social community. Asperger said he valued the unique characters of the children he treated, tailoring his approach to their individual needs. He had a holistic approach. 
children at the elegant and open Weiderhofer Pavilion engaged in a range of activities, from sports to drama to music. Asperger sat with the children, his tall frame hunched over to connect with them at their level. With his intent gaze, he noted all realms of their behaviour in his postdoctoral thesis. Harrow was one of the case studies for his new diagnosis, Autistic Psychopathy. Harrow's school had referred the boy to Asperger's curative education clinic for evaluation. The report stated that the eight and a half year old seldom did as he was told. Harrow talked back, did not do his homework, and complained his lessons were far too stupid. He was ridiculed by his classmates and hit and injured other boys over petty issues. Harrow was even said to crawl on all fours during lessons and commit homosexual acts. His teachers maintained that the boy could succeed if he wanted to, but Harrow had failed every subject and was repeating a grade. He was difficult to test, often uncooperative and unsuccessful in conventional tasks. In certain areas, Harrow demonstrated skills beyond his age. With math, for example, he came to solutions in his own way. What is 47 minus 15? 32. Either add 3 and also add 3 to that which should be taken away, or first take away 7 and then 8. Asperger saw such exceptional originality as evidence of special abilities in many boys. The problem, as Asperger saw it, was that Harrow did not have social feeling. Asperger said Harrow went his own way in a group and never became warm trusting or cheerful in the ward. Harrow resisted the important social habits of daily life. He did not play with other children, but spent much of his time reading in a corner, indifferent. When teased, Asperger held that Harrow lacked any sense of humour. He had a lost gaze and few facial expressions and gestures. Asperger decided that Harrow demonstrated autistic psychopathy. But because of his intelligence, Harrow was on the favourable end of the autistic range. That meant he was capable of remediation and joining the community. Children such as Harrow could be taught social integration and be of social value in specialised technical professions. What these promising children needed, as Berger wrote, was individualised care to nurture their cognitive and emotional growth. He sympathised with their challenges, advocated their potential, and celebrated their uniqueness. This is the benevolent image of Asperger today, but it represents only one side of Asperger's work. While Asperger did support children he believed to be teachable, defending their disabilities, he was dismissive about those he believed to be more disabled. Deprecatory pronouncements could be a death sentence in the Third Reich. And in fact, some of Asperger's judgments were death sentences. Although Harrow passed Asperger's test, Asperger's label of autistic psychopathy still underestimated the boy. Asperger contended that autistic children did not really fit into this world and looked as if they had just fallen from the sky. But Harrow had not really fallen. Like the fly, he was simply making his own way. Harrow explained, the fly is much more skillful and can walk up the slippery glass and can walk up the wall. Just yesterday I saw it has teeny weeny claws on the feet and at the ends tiny little hooks. When it feels that it slips, then it hooks itself up with the hooks. This, story, this is not a story about one boy, however, nor is it about children on the luckier end of Asperger's autistic range. This book is about all the children who face the Third Reich's diagnosis regime and how Nazi psychiatry judged their minds and determined their fates. Diagnoses reflect a society's values, concerns and hopes. As this book uncovers the nightmarish context of autism's creation, it reveals how what today appears to, a singular, to be a singular idea rested upon the community that made it. Asperger's diagnosis of autistic psychopathy emerged from the values and institutions of the Third Reich. So folks, um, on that note, it's going to be a, a fairly deep um, discussion next week. Um, and it's not just talking about the Nazi regime and euthanasia. It's also 
I don't want to talk about where the idea of euthanasia originated from. And it would also explore ideas about the re-emergence of the concept of euthanasia within popular culture today. Um, so we'll be getting a clear picture now of where we're going. Just um, a brief note, on Facebook you will see um, there's a wall that we've set up. Rising Stars Future Dreams, um, RSFD. Um, check on that on Facebook and if you want to join the, um, the ideas, um, just ask to become a member and you'll become a member. That's up now and um, we're getting there. Some of you know, we still got a lot of work to explore, but um, it's a vast, great subject. Also, next week we'll go into a bit more detail about the pharmaceutical, if it's nice actually, the pharmaceutical industry and bipolar. Okay, folks. All right, folks, thank you very much. My thank name's you. Alan English. Yep, and Alan Pritchard, or Alfie as I'm known, and uh, thank you, and thanks for your patience. Goodbye. Bye. Wow.